Why did Lot's daughters lie down with her own father? We first meet Lot in Genesis chapter 11, verse 31. Abraham had left his father's house on God's command and had left with his nephew Lot. Abram and Lot had to separate and go in different directions. One would expect Abram, who received God's promise to have the first choice. However, he generously allowed Lot to choose first. Lot's decision was based only on materialistic considerations, and he chose the land with the most resources. Abram's decision to allow Lot to choose first was a faith-based decision, with Abram focusing on spiritual matters, such as God's promise, rather than temporal ones. Lot made a choice that was utterly self-centered. He parted ways with Abram and set his sights on Sodom. As Lot gazed upon the land, his eyes settled on the vast expanse of the Jordan Valley. It was a sight to behold, teeming with life and bounty. The waters were plentiful, nourishing the soil and all it bore. This valley, in its abundance and beauty, was reminiscent of the Lord's own garden. Lot made his choice to set up his camp close to Sodom, a place infamous for its residents' grievous sins against the Lord. As we delve deeper into the story, the full extent of their corruption comes to light. Here, we see a stark difference between Lot and Abram. While Abram followed God's guidance, looking wherever God directed, Lot took it upon himself to look and choose based on his desires. Lot was lured by the promise of prosperity and ease, enticed into settling in a land that jeopardized his honorable integrity and spiritual teachings. This decision led him into an environment that threatened to rot the values he had learned about the God worshipped by Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He stood at a crossroads, facing a choice between material wealth and spiritual fidelity. And regrettably, he allowed the allure of temporary gains to cloud his judgment. By Genesis chapter 19, at least 25 years have passed since Lot and his family made their departure from Haran. Furthermore, it has been approximately 15 years since Lot went his separate way from Abraham. At this point in the story, Lot, along with his family, has become deeply integrated into the life of the city of Sodom. Lot has climbed the social ladder and has secured a position of authority within the community. His daughters, too, have established their own connections within the city, being betrothed to local men, suggesting they have reached the latter years of their young lives. However, the worst was yet to come. Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. Lot's life saw a gradual decline as he kept compromising. He went from looking toward Sodom, Genesis chapter 13 verse 10, to pitching his tent toward Sodom, Genesis chapter 13 verse 12, to eventually living in Sodom, Genesis chapter 14 verse 12. Unfortunately, he lost everything when Sodom was attacked. Now, after returning to the infamous city, Lot was seen sitting in the gate of Sodom, which indicated that he had become a civic leader. The gate area of an ancient city was like a community center where the city's respected leaders would come together. They would settle arguments, talk over important matters, and keep an eye on everyone coming in or going out of the city. Lot was a good and moral man who felt troubled by the wrongdoing he saw all around him. Despite being a good person, Lot lived in Sodom and Gomorrah, places filled with evil, and this troubled him deeply every day. He was disturbed by the sin around him yet he didn't take strong enough steps to remove himself and his family from that bad environment. This shows us 
that it's not enough to be upset by wrongdoing. We must also take action to avoid being part of it. Lot made a big mistake that had serious consequences. He compromised his beliefs, and as a result, he lost the respect of his family and friends. Lot was very insistent when he invited the visitors into his home. Usually, it was common to offer hospitality to guests, but the way Lot did it was different. He was extremely eager and urgent in his invitation. This shows us that sometimes, the way we do something can be just as important as what we are doing. Genesis chapter 19 verses 4 through 5 Before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, surrounded the house, both young and old, all the people from every quarter. And they called to Lot and said to him, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may have relations with them. The people of Sodom had no respect or consideration for their two guests. They ignored every rule of kindness and decency, driven by their own cruel and wrongful desires. We read, The men of the city, both old and young, all the people from every quarter surrounded the house. This demonstrates that the whole city was engulfed in violence and immorality. It wasn't something out of the ordinary. Rather, it was a common practice among the men of Sodom. Later on, in the book of Ezekiel chapter 16, God expressed strong disapproval of Judah's significant wrongdoing during the later years of the divided kingdom. He likened Jerusalem to the old city of Sodom, calling them akin to sisters. God then drew a parallel between the wrongdoings of Sodom and the sins being committed in Jerusalem during that era. Behold, this was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters, outlying cities, had arrogance, abundant food, and careless ease, but she did not help the poor and needy. They were haughty and committed repulsive acts before me. Therefore, I removed them when I saw it. Ezekiel chapter 16 verses 49 through 50. The message we get from the Ezekiel passage isn't just listing the sins of Sodom, like being proud, lazy, or unfair to the poor, as the only reasons they faced judgment. These were sins that Sodom had, but Jerusalem, another city, was guilty of them too. When we look at Genesis, it's clear that God was upset about more than just those sins. He was also deeply troubled by the terrible acts of sexual violence and immorality happening in Sodom. The phrase committed abomination in Ezekiel likely includes these sins too. So the lesson here is about recognizing and turning away from all kinds of wrongs, not just a few. We read, that we may know them carnally. The sin of the men of Sodom was plainly connected to this. Lot bargains for the life and safety of his guests. Genesis chapter 19 verses 6 through 9. But Lot went out of the doorway to the men and shut the door after him and said, Please, my brothers, do not do something so wicked. See here, I have two daughters who have not known a man intimately. Please, let me bring them out to you instead, and you can do as you please with them. Only do nothing to these men, because they have in fact come under the shelter of my roof for protection. But they said, Get out of the way. And they said, This man Lot came as an outsider to live here temporarily and now he is acting like a judge. Now we will treat you worse than your visitors. So they rushed forward and pressed violently against Lot and came close to breaking down the door of his house. Lot faced a tough challenge in getting his point across. 
He believed in a different sense of right and wrong compared to the men of Sodom. These men were chasing after what they thought was fun, paying no mind to Lot's warnings that their actions were wrong. The first incident involving Lot's daughters appears in Genesis chapter 19 verses 1 through 11. Scripture does not reveal Lot's reasoning for offering up his daughters. Whatever his thought process was, it was wrong and indefensible. Based on what is revealed about Lot's life, one might wonder if he was righteous. However, there is no doubt that God had declared him to be positionally righteous, even during his time in Sodom. Lot meant to appease the men of Sodom, so that the hospitality of his house would not be damaged but he makes the wrong choice in offering his own daughters, and God's messengers overruled him. Lot's decision to offer his daughters to the crowd was appalling and indefensible. The behavior of the Sodomites was a horrifying display of moral decay, yet we find ourselves equally horrified by Lot's readiness to sacrifice his own daughters to satisfy the crowd. This appalling willingness mirrors the crowd's own reprehensible desires. To grasp the full gravity of this narrative, it's crucial to recognize the societal context of those times. Women were undervalued in the pre-Christian era, not afforded the respect and dignity they deserved. Conversely, the value placed on a guest's safety was extraordinarily high. Within this cultural framework, the protection of a guest was often prioritized above the well-being of one's own family members, reflecting a distorted understanding of hospitality and duty. This one came in to stay here, and he keeps acting like a judge. The men of Sodom mocked Lot and rejected his feeble efforts to provide moral and spiritual leadership. Perhaps Lot thought that through compromise, he might have reached these men, but the opposite happened. They had no respect for him whatsoever, even though his friendly first approach led him to call such wicked men my brethren. Genesis chapter 19 verses 10 through 11. But the men reached out their hands and brought Lot into the house with them and shut the door. Then they struck the men who were at the doorway of the house with blindness from the small to the great, so that they became weary of trying to find the doorway. It must have taken significant, perhaps supernatural strength to do what the angels did at the door. Probably for the first time, Lot understood that his guests were more than men. The work of striking the blind men was supernatural. Now, the mob's physical blindness matched its moral blindness. Genesis chapter 19 verses 12 through 14. And the two men, angels, asked Lot, Have you any others here in Sodom, a son-in-law, and your sons and your daughters? Whomever you have in the city, take them out of here, for we are destroying this place because the outcry for judgment against them has grown so great before the Lord that the Lord has sent us to destroy and ruin it. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law, who were betrothed and legally promised to marry his daughters, and said, Get up, get out of this place, for the Lord is about to destroy this city. But to his sons-in-law he appeared to be joking. This was the beginning of Lot's daughter's sins. Their soon-to-be husbands decided not to come with them. They are going to be left behind because the angels are telling Lot he needs to hurry up and get out of Sodom before it's too late. The angels literally had to drag Lot out of the city early in the morning. Of course, the Lord was being merciful by sparing Lot for Abraham's sake. Lot is debased by his daughters. Genesis chapter 19 verse 30. Now Lot went up from Zoar and lived in the mountain together with his two daughters, 
for he was afraid to stay any longer in Zoar, and he lived in a cave with his two daughters. Lot and his daughters were not happy in Zoar, for reasons we don't understand, and it seems the people of Zoar were not happy with them either. So they decided to leave Zoar and move to the mountains, where they lived in a cave. Despite losing everything when Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed, Lot and his family soon had wine. They either took the wine with them from their previous home or they found it in Zoar. Here is the situation with Lot. After he managed to escape a terrible disaster, he found himself in a whole new set of troubles. Here's what went down. Lot couldn't stay in Zoar, a place he initially thought would be safe. He was terrified to live there for a few reasons. First, he might have realized that choosing Zoar was his idea, not God's. He had made his own plan instead of trusting God's guidance, which probably made him feel insecure about his safety there. Secondly, he might have noticed that the people in Zoar were just as bad as those he had left behind in Sodom which would make any righteous person uncomfortable. He might have thought, if God didn't spare Sodom, why would Zoar be any different? Lastly, there was a practical danger. After the disaster, water levels, possibly from the Jordan River, started rising, threatening to flood the plain. This water, mixing with the leftover debris, gradually created what we now know as the Dead Sea. Lot figured that if this water was swallowing up everything else, Zoar was doomed too, despite having dodged the initial catastrophe. The key takeaway here is pretty straightforward. When we make decisions based on our own judgment without seeking God's direction, we often end up in tough spots. Choosing our paths without considering his guidance can lead us into situations that feel unstable and insecure. He found himself compelled to seek refuge in the mountains, selecting a cave as his dwelling place. It seems odd that he didn't go back to Abraham for protection, a man who had twice saved him before. However, it's true that even some good people don't always make the wisest choices for their well-being. Now he felt relieved to retreat to the mountain. The man who once struggled to find sufficient space for himself and his livestock across the entire land, competing with Abraham for territory and aiming to distance himself as much as possible, now found himself confined to a mere cave. There, he barely had space to move, living alone and in fear. Remember, God may deem it fair to limit and humble those who misuse their freedom and abundance. Furthermore, consider Lot's story as a cautionary tale. Those who abandon their spiritual community for worldly gains may ultimately suffer, ensnared by the consequences of their own choices. Genesis chapter 19 verses 31 through 32. The firstborn said to the younger, Our father is aging, and there is not a man on earth available to be intimate with us in the customary way, so that we may have children. Come, let us make our father drunk with wine, and we will lie with him, so that we may preserve our family through our father. The firstborn was the one to hatch this plan. We read, We will lie with him, that we may preserve the lineage of our father. Lot might have thought he was a safe distance from Sodom, but Sodom was closer to him than ever. Sodom lied in the hearts of his own children. In a remote and lonely place, Lot and his daughters committed a serious wrongdoing. It is a sad story. The daughters concocted a sinful scheme to lead their father into transgression. Their sin was arguably more severe. 
They devised a plan to lift their father's spirits in his troubles and woes by intoxicating him. With the hidden agenda, of engaging in outright sinful acts with him. They might have thought like Noah, they were the only survivors. Some may argue that the daughters had a seemingly justifiable reason. Their father lacked male heirs, they were without spouses, and they were uncertain of marrying into the esteemed lineage, fearing that their offspring from other men wouldn't carry on their father's legacy. They might have even pondered the hope that the Messiah would emerge from their lineage, as he was to be a descendant of Terah's lineage, akin to Abraham. With their mother and other family members no longer present, and the prohibition against marrying the detestable Canaanites, they rationalized their thoughts. Note, good intentions are often abused to patronize bad actions, Whatever their pretense was, it is certain that their project was very wicked and vile, and an impudent affront to the very light and law of nature. Let us consider the true nature of their actions. They were undeniably wicked, a blatant disrespect to the inherent moral laws. It's interesting to note that even the most severe punishments for committing sins don't deter people with corrupt hearts from continuing to do wrong. It's baffling how desires that should be eliminated can suddenly reappear, even in those who have recently witnessed catastrophic consequences for similar actions. This teaches us that without divine grace, the human heart is powerless to resist evil. It is important to understand that being alone can be just as dangerous as being with others, as it comes with its own set of temptations. This can be seen in the story of Joseph, who found himself at risk of sin when he was isolated with Potiphar's wife, as told in Genesis chapter 39 verse 11. It serves as a reminder that individuals, even family members, must be vigilant in guarding their thoughts and resisting any immoral impulse, especially when left in solitude. To keep the devil from gaining a foothold in our hearts, it's crucial that we remain on guard against sin every moment of our lives. This means we need to be watchful, not just when we're around others, but also when we're alone. We have to ask for God's help continuously to maintain our moral values and fight against the temptations of sin, no matter what situation we find ourselves in. It's a continuous battle, one that requires our attention and dedication at all times to ensure that we don't let our guard down and allow the devil away into our hearts. Genesis chapter 19 verses 33 through 38. So they gave their father wine that night, and the firstborn went in and lay with her father. And he did not know when she lay down or when she got up, because he was completely intoxicated. Then the next day, the firstborn said to the younger, Behold, I lay with my father last night. Let us make him drunk with wine tonight also, and then you go in and lie with him so that we may preserve our family through our father. So they gave their father wine that night also, and the younger got up and lay with him, and again he did not know when she lay down or when she got up. Thus both the daughters of Lot conceived by their father. The firstborn gave birth to a son, and named him Moab, from father. He is the father of the Moabites to this day. The younger also gave birth to a son and named him Ben-Ami, son of my people. He is the father of the Ammonites to this day. Lot, by his own foolish actions and lack of caution, found himself in a terribly unfortunate situation. He allowed himself to be tricked by his own children resulting in him getting drunk on two consecutive nights 
and committing this great sin, as noted in Genesis chapter 19, verse 33. This prompts us to ask, what is the nature of humanity? Even the best among us can falter and make grave mistakes when they are not guided and supported by God. Listen closely and understand the danger of feeling too secure. Consider the story of Lot, a man who managed to live a righteous life in the corrupt city of Sodom. He avoided indulging in the vices of the city and deeply mourned its wickedness, standing strong against it. However, even Lot, when he retreated to a mountain, a place where he thought he'd be safe from temptation, found himself tragically succumbing to it. This teaches us a crucial lesson. Even if you believe you are standing tall, unshakable and steadfast, you must always be cautious and vigilant. Remember, no place on earth, except for the sacred realms above, can fully shield us from the harmful temptations that lurk around, including those set by Satan himself. Now, let's talk about the danger of drunkenness. Understand that drunkenness isn't just a sin on its own. It's a gateway to numerous other sins, some of which can be exceptionally vile and damaging, potentially leaving lasting scars and dishonor. Remember, avoiding drunkenness isn't just about preventing a single sin. It's about protecting yourself from a cascade of wrongdoings that could follow. Always be mindful of the choices you make and the consequences they carry, especially when it comes to substances that could impair your judgment and lead you astray. The peril of being tempted by our closest family members and friends, those we cherish, respect and anticipate kindness from, is very real. Consider a lot a man known for his self-control and moral integrity, who despite being resilient against external pressures, was deceived into wrongdoing by the very daughters he trusted. This teaches us that we must be cautious at all times and aware of the potential for betrayal, even in our most trusted circles. It's crucial to understand that temptation can come from the most unexpected places, and we should always be prepared to resist it. However, it's important to remember that even within the lineage of Judah, from which our Savior comes, they are instances of such births. Moreover, Ruth, who was from Moab, is also included in his family tree. This history does not justify the wrong, but shows that redemption and purpose can emerge from even troubled beginnings. Matthew chapter 1 verses 3 through 5 Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Perez was the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram. Ram was the father of Amminadab, Amminadab the father of Naashon, and Naashon the father of Salmon. Salmon was the father of Boaz by Rahab. Boaz was the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse. Observe that after this, we don't hear anything more about Lot or what happened to him. It's very likely that he felt sorry for his mistakes, asked for forgiveness, and received it. However, the fact that the Bible doesn't mention him anymore teaches us an important lesson about the effects of drinking too much. When people drink, they often forget what they should remember. But there's more. Society tends to forget them too. Many individuals who could have been remembered with admiration and respect are instead forgotten or remembered with disdain because of their drinking habits. This should be a warning to all of us about the dangers of alcohol and how it can not only harm our lives, but also affect how we are remembered. This might be an uncomfortable story to hear, 
And you might wonder, why is this in the Bible? But it's much better for young people to learn about right and wrong from the Bible, where bad actions are shown as bad, than to learn from rude words written on walls or from nasty stories. Everyone will find out about bad things at some point, but the Bible always makes it clear that God does not like sin and will punish it. It's strange but true that Lot, even though he was drunk, did the exact bad thing he had once talked about with the men of Sodom. He was with his daughters in a way he should not have been. They gave birth to boys, Moab and ben -Ami, whose descendants were the Moabites and Ammonites, perennial enemies of Israel. Moab sounds like the words from father, and ben -Ami means son of my kinsman. These etymologies perpetuated for Israel the ignominious beginning of these wicked enemies. The Ammonites? We find references to the Ammonite people throughout the early history of Israel. In the early chapters of Israel's story, we often come across the Ammonite people. These Ammonites shared a Semitic lineage with the Israelites. Yet despite this blood connection, they were more frequently foes than allies. During Moses' era, the lush lands along the Jordan River Valley were home to not just the Ammonites, but also the Amorites and Moabites. After Israel's exodus from Egypt, the Ammonites chose not to aid them. For this refusal to help, God rebuked the Ammonites. Yet when the Israelites were on the cusp of entering their promised land, God had clear directives. Do not provoke the Ammonites or engage in battle with them. I have not given you their land to possess, for I have allotted it to the descendants of Lot. Deuteronomy chapter 2 verse 19 The territories adjacent to the Ammonites fell under the domains of the Israelite tribes, Gad, Reuben, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, which were originally Amorite lands. Now the Ammonites adhered to paganism, venerating deities like Milcom and Molech. God explicitly instructed the Israelites to avoid marrying these pagans, to prevent them from falling into the snare of idol worship. Yet King Solomon didn't heed this warning and took Naamah and Ammonite as his wife. This sin even affected Solomon down the line. Consequently, just as God had cautioned, Solomon was lured into the practice of idolatry. The deity Molech was particularly barbaric. Depicted as a fire god with a calf's face, his outstretched arms ready to receive infant sacrifices. The Ammonites, reflecting the savagery of their deity, exhibited extreme cruelty. For instance, when Nahash the Ammonite was negotiating a treaty, he demanded the mutilation of each Israelite man by removing their right eye. Furthermore, Amos chapter 1 verse 13 condemns the Ammonites for their vicious acts, like attacking women with children in the lands they aimed to dominate. Under the rule of King Saul, the nation of Israel emerged victorious against the Ammonites bringing them under Israelite control as subjects. Following in Saul's footsteps, King David maintained dominance over the Ammonites, and he even went as far as laying siege to their capital city to ensure Israel's firm grip on power. However, after Israel and Judah went their separate ways, the Ammonites started to forge alliances with those who stood against Israel signaling a shift in their loyalties and strategies. As we move forward in time to the 7th century BC, we see the Ammonites reclaiming some measure of independence, but this resurgence was short-lived. About a century later, Nebuchadnezzar, a powerful ruler, conquered them, 
reshaping their destiny. During the time when Persia ruled the region, a man named Tobiah, who hailed from Ammon, is mentioned in the scriptures as possibly overseeing the area. Yet the community he governed was diverse, composed not only of Ammonites, but also of Arabs and various other groups. By the time we reach the era described in the New Testament, Jews had established themselves in the region previously known as Ammon, now called Perea. This integration marked significant changes in the demographic and cultural landscape. The Ammonites, as a distinct people, last appeared in historical records in the 2nd century, mentioned by Justin Martyr, who observed their considerable numbers. However, during the Roman era, a notable transformation occurred. The Ammonites gradually merged with the Arab population, effectively blending into the broader tapestry of the region's societies. They also gave birth to the Moabites. The Moabites were a tribe descended from Moab, the son of Lot, born of an unacceptable relationship with his oldest daughter. Their beginnings were in Zoar, a land nestled by the southeastern shores of the Dead Sea, wherefrom they spread their reach eastward beyond the Jordan River. As time marched on, the landscape of their world shifted, the Amorites, as when the Israelites embarked on their legendary exodus, they skirted Moab, traversing the rugged wilderness to the east, moving toward lands north of the Arnon. But the Moabites, stricken with fear at this migration, and their king Balak, felt a deep unease. In their distress, they turned for help to the Midianites, kindling an alliance against the tide of change. Let's focus on a truly remarkable figure from the Bible who originated from Moab, and her name is Ruth. She was born among the Moabites, yet she shares a connection with Israel through her ancestor Lot, Abraham's nephew, as stated in Genesis chapter 11, verse 31. Ruth stands as a powerful testament to how the Almighty can transform someone's life, guiding it along a path he has sovereignly chosen. We witness the unfolding of God's flawless design in Ruth's journey, a manifestation of his divine intervention that he extends to all his beloved children. Despite her roots being entrenched in the pagan traditions of Moab, Ruth's encounter with the God of Israel was transformative. By embracing faith, she became a beacon of God's love and power, showcasing her devotion to him. Remarkably, Ruth, the woman from Moab, is acknowledged as one of the eminent women listed in the lineage of Jesus Christ, as noted in Matthew chapter 1 verse 5. This inclusion underscores her significance and the profound impact of her faith journey demonstrating how God's grace can elevate anyone, regardless of their past, to play a pivotal role in his grand narrative. 